What's up, family? This is your man, not your boy. Go black to Africa. One might, one might ask this. Hey, he's done about four videos on this gay homosexual stuff. Why? Let me tell you why. You see, that is the root to destruction. That right there is when you can get into a people's mind to lose whom they are. You got them. A man who does not know who he is does not know where he come from, let alone a woman and cause that confusion, you will surely die. Now, watch this video, but let me just leave you with some information. These pastors, bishops, evangelists, and all those jokers there that you find in the Western world that you're gonna see, they always wanna stand on and try to answer for what they think. No, 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 we don't care what you think. What does it say in that Bible that you be carrying, preaching to all the congregation? Why are you taking their money and you don't wanna talk about the subject of homosexuality to save your people? Why? Because they have fear of losing that money. So when you have talk conversations with your pastor, your prophet, your bishop, whoever it is, stop asking them, what do you think? What does God say? If that's what you say God is in that Bible that you have read from to your congregation. Now, there are people who say, Jesus he never mentioned nothing about no homosexuality. He never mentioned anything about that. Not one time did he. Yeah, that's true. But you know what? To the, not for the most part, he did mention, but not in a direct way that you want. He didn't mention nothing about sleeping with your daughter, sleeping with your son, your mama, your daddy. He didn't mention about sleeping with animals. So what? Does that give you a permission because it was not mentioned in that fashion? But it was before it turned flesh. Let's look at it and see. Go to Leviticus 18, because I'm going to give y'all some fuel to mess with these fools who sit out here and talk about the Bible. And they call themselves the so-called people who believe in God. But you can't believe what he says in this Bible that you carrying around. So let's go to right here to Leviticus 18 and uh, 22. Please read above that and below that. And it's going to give you clarity of what it is, why this was put in place for the children of Israel to follow these things. Leviticus 18 and 22. It says right here, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Neither shall thou lie down with a beast to devour thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. And it goes on to tell you, other things you shouldn't lie down with. Let's go on over here to Leviticus 20. Uh, and um, let's go over to Leviticus 20 and 12. Yeah, Leviticus 20 and 12. This is the fuel that you can always use. Write it down. When these fools come across and talk that smack and talking about they believe in some God. Oh, yeah, you do. But it ain't the Yahweh that I know. That's the difference that y'all got to get out of saying God. That is their God. Yahweh is the way, not that daggone what they talking about God because it's anything goes. Now, we're going to get on down here, like I said, to um, twenty Leviticus 20 and, and 13. It says right here, well, let's go to 12. If you can keep going up further, just read the thing because it speaks about the whole law of it. And it says, 12 says, and if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have brought confusion. They, their blood shall be upon them. 13, if a man also lie with a mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And it continues with that right there. But let's go on because some people are going to say, you don't say it in the New Testament. That's what it's really all about. See, these people are all about confusion, trying to squeeze and wiggle their lifestyle into what they want. Let's go on over to Romans 1. And um, let's go to uh, Romans 1 and verse 26. All right. Well, let's go to 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator? Who is blessed forever? For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change their natural use into, wit, into that which is against nature. Lesbianism. 27. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust one towards another. 
men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meant. Now, I'm going to go ahead and leave you with the watch this video and watch these pastors wiggle through and try to play the game and try to play it safe. And all of them said, well, what I, what I and I, but what does God say? This is your man, not your boy. Go black to Africa. But does that mean that you're saying, I just, because I want to be clear and I don't want to, to interpret anything that isn't. Does that mean that you're saying that you believe that being gay would is a sin? So when Christ. you see civil partnerships being sanctioned, you think that's wrong? Well, presumably. yeah, I think it's I think it's wrong, but I'm not going to bash those people. I'm not going to be against those people. They're they're good people. They're they're good people. They're they're good people. It's like you're judging the person, aren't you? Aren't you? Well, to me, I just I'm not I'm not the one to judge and say you know, who's bad and who's good. Otherwise, you'd have to go through everybody, you know, every, every one of us and say, well, you know what, I got some pride or I've got, I, I had an evil thought the other day. Those are sins too. I don't know that God is judging sins on different levels, but we pick out that one. So, I mean, our message, if, I mean, you know, if you listen to my message, they're about lifting people up. And so it's not, I mean, I really talk about the homosexuality when we get on the interviews. I mean, I really talk about the homosexuality when we get on the interviews. It's an issue that, um, you know, it's a hard issue and, I don't know that I fully understand it. So then let me ask you a question, because when you came on Piers Morgan show a while ago, he asked you about homosexuality, sure. Christianity, homosexuality. And almost every time we have a pastor on, it's a conversation we have. And you, you are known for these uplifting ceremony uh, services, and you talk to a lot of, what's like 45,000 people who attend. And I always wonder when you are, you say homosexuality is a sin, and there's a bunch of people who clearly are, are gay, who are, ex sure. are in your church. You're calling them sinners. I mean, that. Well, so that. It's I the think opposite of uplifting, I would it say. It does, but one, one, I don't necessarily focus on that. I only talk about that on the interviews. One, one, I don't necessarily focus on that. I only talk about that on the interviews. I mean, so don't you think, though, that with the, with the country struggling with increasing acceptance of all its citizens and your for basic fairness for everybody, that in situations where, like, we're trying to pass these marriage equality bills in certain states now, that you ought to, you have an important voice to lend to that, especially to kids who are may be worried about who they are and where they fit in the community? Well, you know, I think I have an important voice, but I'm very, I think I've been good. I think part of my, if you want to call it success, is I've stayed in my lane, and my lane is lifting people's spirits, and there, there are issues that good Bible-believing people see on both sides of the fence. I, I, but So my question is, when you're talking to your 45,000 people in your, in your service, and some of them are gay, you're saying to them, you're a sinner. Well, certainly that first off, uh, in my services, I don't cover all these issues that we talk about no, I, here. I, I, yeah, and so you remember, you know, I am. And I don't understand all the, all those issues. And so, you know, I try to stick on the issues that I do understand. And I, okay. and I know this, I'm for everybody. I'm not for pushing people down. And obviously, I've watched the story on bullying and stuff, other things like that that comes from it. So I don't know where the fine line is, but I do try to stay in my lane and, you know, lift people's spirits. A question coming in from uh, Black185 in our, in our uh, digital community said, do you, do you think, I'm assuming, uh, LGBT community and the black church can coexist? Absolutely. I, I, let me push that question, because that, that's sort of an obvious yes. Church ain't turning nobody away. How should the black church and the LGBT community exist? I think it's going to be diverse from church to church. Every church has a different opinion on the issue, and every gay person is different. And I think that to to speak the church, the black church or white church or any kind of church you want to call it, are all the same is totally, totally not true. And all gay people are not the same. The, the, the types of relationships that are afforded are based on the types of people in each individual case. Yeah. And LGBTs of wipes and sorts have to find a household of worship that reflects what your views are and what you believe like anybody else. And the church should have the right to have its own convictions and values. If you don't like those convictions and values and you totally disagree with it, don't try to change my house, move into your own and, and establish that sort of thing and find somebody who gets what you get about faith. And uh, trust me, I've talked to enough LGBT, they are not all the same. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Anyone any, and all Christians No, no. Uh, but... How, how do we, first of all, has your thinking evolved on this? E evolved and evolving. Mm -hmm. Evolved and evolving. E evolved and evolving. 
mm -hmm. evolved and evolved. Well, well it's a complex issue. It's a real complex issue, and it was in the Bible days. Sexuality versus spirituality. Paul spends a lot of time wrestling back and forth trying to understand, uh, should a woman wear her head covered? Is, you know, uh, should you cut your hair? I mean, they grappled back then, and we're grappling now because we are humans, and we are flawed, and we are not God. Yeah. Once you understand you're not God, you, you leave yourself an out clause <laughs> to grow. <laughs> I know that's right. Yeah, to grow. Hello, I'm Michael. To support this kind of content, you can just do two simple things. One, subscribe and click the bell icon. Two, click on new videos and watch them until the end. Your support is what motivates me to keep making videos. Thanks for all your support and encouragement. Just to play devil's advocate, I mean, do you feel like... That's hard for you yeah. because you're so sweet. Like, yeah. <laughs> but but do you feel like, you know, there you have a moral imperative to to speak publicly about some of these more controversial issues? No, because we try to be like Jesus. Very rarely did Jesus ever talk about morality or social issues. He was about the deeper things of the heart. Every article I've read about you guys says he declined to discuss gay marriage. Yeah, it's a misquote because I do discuss it, just not the way people want me to. When it comes to homosexuality, I refuse to let uh, another human being or a, a, a immediate moment uh, dictate how we approach it. Jesus was in the thick of uh, an era where homosexuality, just like it is today, was wildly prevalent. And I'm still waiting for someone to show me the quote where Jesus addressed it on the record in front of people. You won't find it because he never did. Argument number one is the argument that Jesus never addressed homosexuality. This is a very popular approach. Uh, people will look at this and they'll say, well, you're a Christian, which means you're a follower of Christ, right? Well, yeah, I'm a follower of Christ. Well, as a follower of Christ, it seems very strange to me that you're making a big deal out of something that Jesus never mentioned one time in the gospel. Not one time. And for most Christians, they hear that and we're just sort of taken aback. And, you know, our response is usually something along the lines of, uh, well, um, so you, um, well, was, was, was bad? We don't, we don't, what? And we just don't know what to say, right? Um, well, here's what you say. <laughs> Number one, Jesus did address homosexuality. Uh, he addressed it in Matthew chapter 5 and in Matthew chapter 19. Because in Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 19, he addressed the issue of marriage. He rooted his understanding of marriage and the teaching in Genesis chapter 2. The teaching in Genesis chapter 2 that gave us marriage between a man and a woman for the purposes of procreation, illustration, and sanctification. He also made it very clear that what man has joined together, what God has joined together, man cannot separate. In other words, God is the author of marriage, not man. Therefore, God is the one who defines marriage, not man. Therefore, man does not have the right to introduce the concept of same-sex marriage. Number one, because by definition, it's not marriage, it's another thing. And number two, because by definition, it goes against what was created in Genesis chapter two. So Jesus did address homosexuality. Do you feel that homosexuality is a sin? You know, I, I can't honestly answer on that. I have too many people that I love that they are homosexual. I don't know. I can't say one way or the other. I'm not God. So when yeah. people ask questions like that, that's what my go-to is. I just say read the Bible and find out for yourself. And when you find out, let me know because I'm learning too. So if one of your kids, let's say one of your male sons, yeah. comes to you at 20, 23 years old and says, hey, dad, this is my husband. We're engaged. We're going to get married next month, and I want you to be in the wedding. Yeah. What would you say? My thing is like this. I don't, like, my brother's gay. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, I don't, I don't condemn him. I don't look down on him for him being attracted to the opposite sex. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's something. Same that, sex. Yeah, or the same sex, excuse me. I don't condemn yeah. him. You know what I'm saying? Like, if anything, we'll, we, we'll dialogue so that I can have a better understanding. Because I don't profess to be like, I got this all figured out. 
and I know the way this should be. Like I'm trying to read the Bible. I'm trying to have conversations with people and I'm trying to understand, you know, the, the perspective, you know what I'm saying? And I, I feel like anybody who wants to come at a person negatively, like if you was, if you was a Christian and you came at me negatively, then it's like, you're not giving me the grace and the space to be a learner. You know what I mean? Help me, you know, give me the space and the grace to learn. And, and that's how, that's how we move forward. You know what I'm saying? So you could point something out to me and say, Hey, this is what it says. Lecrae, you should know better. You should know this. Well, you know, give me the grace and the space to, to take my time and to understand the perspective on it and to understand why these people think it this way. And it, like, that's, that's the perspective I have. I'm more of a learner and I, and I give people the grace and the space as I'm processing and as I'm learning, um, you know, and just walk with people through that. You know what I mean? To just be, be a lifelong learner, man. So what's wrong with homosexuality? Um, a number of things, but just a few in this context. Number one, it's a violation of the created order. It's a violation of the created order. It's not how we were made. Secondly, it denounces procreation categorically. It denounces procreation categorically. And I say categorically because, you know, the homosexual lobby, they try to be slick. Or are you saying that people who are beyond childbearing years shouldn't get married? No, because categorically, they are still the two corresponding parts of humanity that produce children and produce a family that is designed to raise, rear, and protect children. So categorically, they're still in the same ballpark even if they don't have children. Thirdly, it blasphemes the illustration. It blasphemes the illustration. This is especially true when we understand the illustration of Christ and his bride, the church. And then finally, it denies the very need for sanctification because it takes what God calls sinful and calls it righteous. God calls this an abomination and we instead call it righteous. It's the only sin, by the way, for which God destroyed cities with fire and brimstone. It's unique. It's unique. It's not like other sins. It's unique. Not all sins are called abominations. Homosexuality is unique in that regard. Very few sins in that category. And not all sins were the, ended in God destroying twin cities with fire and brimstone. It's unique in that regard. Not all sins are talked about in the Bible, like in Romans 1, as having a penalty in the flesh. Homosexuality is. It's unique in that regard. But listen to this. To suggest in public that homosexuality might be chosen is to open the can of worms labeled moral choice and sin and give the religious intransigence a stick to beat us with. Straights must be taught. Excuse me. Straights must be taught that it is as natural for some persons to be homosexual as it is for others to be heterosexual. Wickedness and seduction have nothing to do with it. And since no choice is involved, gayness can be no more blameworthy than straightness. I want you to notice that this is an argument from origins. This is an argument based upon their understanding of the nature of man. This is why Genesis matters. They're arguing that this is the way we were made or this is the way that we have evolved, and therefore, there is no morality associated with it. And this is a dangerous statement to make. I, I mean, suppose, you know, we can, we can say that I have a genetic pre predisposition toward violence. Does that make it okay? Because we can prove that I have a genetic predisposition? If I have a genetic predisposition toward drunkenness, does that make it okay? Officer pulls me over. Sir, you been drinking? I said, for I don't even know. <laughs> Sir, you want to get out of the car? Okay, but before I do, you should need to know, I got that drunk gene. <laughs> oh, well, sir, I'm sorry. Please, weave on your way. And so, out of step with psychology, what? Psychology proves this stuff? Yeah, because everybody knows that that's how people are born, right? 
We have the LeVay brain study, you know, uh, Bailey, Bailey and Pillard's twin study. Um, we have Hamer's X chromosome study. Um, you know, we've got uh, Savick's pheromone study. Uh, so, of course, I mean, all of these things, by the way, none of these things, none of these things, none of these things has proven a genetic connection to homosexuality. And even if it did, it wouldn't matter. So this is how they argue. One way they argue is this. They say homosexuality is, an, is as immutable as ethnicity. You've heard that, right? It's immutable. It's just like ethnicity. It's just like your race. That's not true. Uh, by the way, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. That's 2,000-year-old evidence that people stopped being homosexual. 2,000-year-old evidence. You can say what you want about Michael Jackson. He did not stop being black. <laughs> Another thing you do, as far as jamming, you want us to understand what jamming is. Jamming works when you take two contradictory images and juxtapose them. And so Christian people hate the idea of the Nazis and the skinheads and the KKK. So what you do is you portray people who are against same-sex marriage as being akin to Nazis, skinheads, and the KKK. Since nobody wants to be accused of being a Nazi, a skinhead, or the KKK, eventually nobody's going to want to be accused of being anti-same-sex marriage. This is jamming. This is why in your average Sunday sermon from a pastor that deals with homosexuality, the first third of it will be apologizing. Imagine this on a Sunday morning from a church. Now, church, we're going to address the issue of adultery, but I don't want you to be alarmed. I am not here to bash adulterers. I love adulterers. Jesus loves adulterers. I have friends who are adulterers. And I believe that our church needs to be open and accepting toward adulterers. And I want you to be, right? That just feels wrong, doesn't it? Every time a pastor goes to preach on homosexuality, we expect that to be up front. Why? Because we've been jammed. That's why. We've been jammed. It has been successful. That's why the most onerous sin that you can imagine from a scriptural perspective has us apologizing for saying what God says about it. So don't let anybody tell you that it's not loving if you stand flat-footed and speak the truth about this issue of homosexuality. What's not loving is to look someone in the eye when God says they are in jeopardy of an eternity in hell and merely wink and nod at their sin because you're afraid of being called names.